Hey friends, I love doing life with all of you at our South Naperville campus, Bolingbrook, Wheaton, Naperville, and online people. Welcome back to Side by Side. Here's what I want to do. I want to start today's study by talking about life transitions. You know, uh, the journey through life as the years pass inevitably takes us to many life transitions. We're going to use this bridge as just a visual image of those transitions where our journey takes us from one side, one, one chapter of life, over into another very different, at times, chapter of life. Think about it with me. What are the, the big life transitions? Well, there's graduation, right? Students, I have a daughter who's a senior in high school and she's in the last three months approaching that major transition where she will say goodbye to this environment that she's known, this culture that she's known, most of the people. It's a big deal when you graduate. And then there's marriage. You know, I, I used to view marriage as a beautiful life transition, but now as a dad of two precious daughters who are getting to that age, knowing that some slime buckets are going to steal my princesses, I'm not as fond of that life transition, but it's a big one, marriage. How about when you have your first child? There's another, huh? Got a friend in my small group who's uh, in the early stages of just having their first child. And it is so fun to watch. He's like, man, this is a game changer. He and his bride were enjoying the freedom of no kids. And that little baby changes everything. He's had his last good night of sleep for some time, huh? What, kind of, what happens next? Well, a, a job change can be a huge life transition. Some people move away to a new town, big one. When you retire, wow, that is a major life transition. Or the death of a spouse. We've got a couple of friends in our church that come to mind who in recent months have lost their spouse, in some cases after 50, almost 60 years. That's a big one. Life transitions are really challenging and they're inevitable. Friends, we'll, we'll have, what, a dozen of these major life transitions in our journey. And the question is, are we good at them? We're going to learn today in our text how we can approach those transitions in a way where we do them well, where there's actually a beauty in all of them. You know, some of you may be saying, Jeff, I want to learn how to do life transitions really well. Maybe you've seen people who have been utterly devastated, just taken out by those challenging transitions. And you want to learn the skills to, to not be taken out, to survive, to thrive through them. But you may be wondering, though I want to learn those skills, I'm not sure what life transitions has to do with small group life. You know, this series, Side by Side, is all about community, about journeying through life in a circle of Christian friends. We've been studying in the book of Acts, those early chapters where the early church had an amazing community. Let me tell you the connection. As we turn to the book of Acts, we're about to see that community go through a huge and epic life transition. They're about to disperse. So it's, it's a sad moment. I mean, they've had community at its very best. This church has loved each other and shared life together, meeting daily from house to house, sharing meals, giving to help each other. And as tight as this community is, friends, after four years, most scholars say it's about four years that it lasts. And as we get to Acts chapter 8, Boom! It's over. And yet they're going to show us how to do life transition well. Because not only did this group survive the sorrow, the sadness, the loss of the end of their community, they saw the hand of God use that life transition to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. In our groups, 
life transition is going to hit us all. Our group will come to an end and disperse someday. Or maybe it'll split. Or maybe some prominent people in the group will move away. But if we know how to do it well, we will survive the sadness and we will advance the cause of Christ. Because through the word of God, we've learned how to handle life transitions really well. Imagine with me, these people had enjoyed the best friendships of their life. In the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, it describes this community as so tight, as so powerful. Those are the glory days, friends. They were just loving doing life together. And now let's take a look at that fateful day when, boom, it all ended. We're turning now to Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1, where we're going to be studying the first four verses of Acts 8. It says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. All right, let's start by going back to verse 1. And I want to highlight, on that day, a great persecution broke out. What is on that day? Well, what day? Well, it's a reference to the day that Stephen was martyred, killed for being a Christian. Friends, you may recall Stephen. We learned about him last week. Last week, do you recall? The apostles and the people picked seven new leaders to oversee and manage the food distribution ministry to the widows. And one of the top-notch leaders that was chosen was this Stephen, so zealous about his faith. He was out there debating with people about Christ, and he eventually got arrested. When he was brought to stand trial before the court, he very boldly proclaimed his confidence in Jesus. And the opposition was so upset that they killed him. Friends, this is the first time there is a Christian martyr uh, the, the, the persecution, the opposition to Christianity has been growing. You may recall back in chapter 4, Peter and John were arrested, and they were threatened and then released. But then in chapter 5, all the apostles were arrested, and they were beaten physically and then released. But now here... We find it was in chapter 7 that Stephen was killed. So you see the escalating of persecution. It is so bad that now the Christians realize Stephen is just the first of many who are going to be killed. And in a moment of desperation, a decision is made. They need to go. We need to scatter. Now it says, let me highlight this, all except the apostles. What do you think that's about? Why why did the apostles stay and everybody else get scattered? Well, the truth is we don't know. The the theologians love to speculate. I I think it's probably this. There were like over 10,000 Christians in Jerusalem at that time. And so they're easy game. There's so many of them. I think the decision was made, we can hide a few, but we can't hide 10,000. So the majority, you all go, flee for your life. The apostles, they will in hiding remain here in Jerusalem and do their best to lead the underground church in this city. Let's let's highlight the word scattered. Friends, this is the saddest day in these people's lives. Again, they had grown to love each other so much. And on the day they were scattered, where they left and ran for their lives, they were having to say goodbye to the city that they had lived in for the last four years and loved, to the people they had grown to know and love, to the leaders, to 
Everything that was familiar, it was now gone as they left the city fleeing for their lives. You know, change. This is a major life transition. It is so difficult. Uh, Psychologists talk about our liminal space. A liminal space is that crazy land in between. You know, when you've left one part of life and you haven't settled in the other and you're in that that tumultuous in-between place. It's a tough thing for everybody. You've left the people you're familiar with, the routines that you know, the environment, and you're not yet established the new normal. You know, eventually you'll get there where you're familiar with the new routine and new people and a new environment. But when you're in that liminal space, that land in between, it's really hard. It's very unsettling for all of us. And that's where these people were at. You know, though they went through a very difficult life transition, they did it well. In fact, in the four verses that we've read, there are four keys to doing life transitions really well. Let's take a look at the four of them, shall we? The first one is this. You got to grieve. Remember what it said in verse two? Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. As this persecution uh, started, they were already grieving. And you know, grieving is really an important part of doing a transition in a healthy way. You know, it says that they buried him. They had a funeral. Why do we do funerals? It's, It's a little ceremony to help us connect, help us grieve, help us process a very significant life transition. Uh, I I do want to comment, though, that we grieve, we Christians grieve a little differently. We Christians grieve with praise, with thanksgiving to God. Do, Do you know what I mean by that? When we grieve, what we're doing is we're acknowledging a loss of something very important to us. And that something that was very important to us, we recognize as a gift from God. So I'll talk with widows at funerals who will say, I am so grateful for the 60 years of marriage God gave me to be married to that wonderful man. My my mother-in-law lost her husband, my father-in-law, four years ago now. And uh, we used to joke that after my father-in-law died, he became Saint Harold. Because the way my mother-in-law speaks of him is, I was married to the greatest man ever. She's genuinely thankful to God. Sometimes it's not until we lose something that we appreciate what a special gift it was. And so with the end of every season, part of our grief is thanking God for what was good and wonderful about that season. Thanking God for what we now realize we miss so intently. So there's a thankfulness to God for what we had, and there's a weeping for what we've lost. And I don't want to minimize this. You know, some people try to say, Christians, we've got to have joy all the time. And there is true. There is a pervading joy deep down. But sometimes at the forefront is intense sadness. And you know what? That's okay. We believers need to mourn. And if you've got a life transition where you've lost a job or a loved one or a home, whatever it might be, it's okay to grieve. In fact, it's healthy to grieve. You know, the uh, Christian counselors that have helped my mother-in-law have said, the only way out is through. Do you understand that? If you want to get out of grief, you've got to pass through it. The only cure to grief is to grieve. And God actually meets us in the sorrow and the sadness as we take a look at what we're losing and weep with him. And he'll meet us in that moment. And grief, godly sorrow, can be a very good thing and a necessary step in a life transition. So so that's the first key, grieve. And the second is trust. What I mean is, trust that God is still present and active. Let me go to verse 3. It says, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. You say, well, what is encouraging about this? At first glance, that's a terrible verse. 
talking about an enemy who's got authority, power, and is out to crush, destroy the church, imprisoning men and women. That's a terrible verse. Here's the key. Who's doing it? Saul. What do we know? What do all those who read it originally know? That Saul was going to become Paul and the greatest hero of the church planting phase of the cause of Christ. We know that this guy who's such an enemy, who was so terrifying back then, was to become this great leader who powerfully fought for God. The enemy was going to become the foe, the anti-Christian, the Christian. And so by referring to this devastating event, there's a little irony in it. Luke, who wrote Acts, is saying things looked terrible. But we know that God was still at work. God still had a plan, and the plan was unexpected and glorious. You know, when you go through a life transition, sometimes it all looks like it's all falling apart. It looks like, God, where are you? I am in chaos and hurt. But in those moments, it's so important that we know, trust that the Lord is present, that he has a plan, and that he's still at work. It's very easy to lose focus on that truth. But in your chaos of transition, trust that the Lord is by your side and that the best is yet to come. God still has great things in store for you. Well, what's next? The, the third step is discover. Discover the upside of the new chapter of life. Let me, let me read. I'm actually going back to something I've overlooked in verse 1. Remember what it said in verse 1? All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria. Let's highlight that. Friends, it's so interesting. That's chapter 8, verse 1. Let's go back now to verse Eight of chapter 1, kind of the reverse of those two numbers. That's where Jesus had commissioned the uh, disciples, the Christians, and said, you will be my witnesses in Jer Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria. There's that same connection again. The plan of Jesus all along had been to get them to do ministry in Jerusalem, but then to get them out and to spread the gospel. Judea is the land surrounding Jerusalem. Samaria is a territory north of Judea. And Jesus says, you, you got to go, you got to go. A statement said to the very ends of the earth eventually. But what he does, what the Lord does, is he uses persecution to implement the next step in his worldwide vision. You see, this uh, Judea and Samaria was, was always part of God's plan. And so the irony is that this great persecution that's so difficult that leads to a painful transition is, in fact, providing opportunity for them to fulfill the will of God. Isn't that beautiful? Friends, when we look at our new situation, the new chapter of life, you may be grieving and saying, this one is bad, it's not as good as the last chapter of my journey. Well, maybe so, but here's the question. Are there opportunities in the new chapter that you need to discover? Do you need to say, Lord, in what way is this new chapter of my life the perfect opportunity for me to complete your great will as far as using my life and advancing your cause. There's something unique about the new chapter in your life. There always is. Can we discover it with the Lord and embrace it? Uh, what comes to example is my father. My, my dad loved his career in finance. But the day came when retirement was the appropriate step, and so he retired and I knew he was grieving. I knew he was going to miss out on the thrill of his work life. But my dad sat back and thought, well, what can I do with retirement? What, what does retirement afford me, opportunity-wise, to be of service to God that the previous chapter of my life didn't? And my dad found some volunteer, volunteering at church. He volunteers driving a bus, taking physically disabled people to physical therapy. My dad is spending his time volunteering. My dad's recognized the opportunity for him to be more social. Uh, he was so busy back in his work days that as far as building relationships with non-believers with an evangelistic objective, 
Didn't have as much of that as he would have liked. But retirement, it's providing him and my mom opportunity to meet people far from God. I called my dad this week and he's like, yeah, we had lunch with some new friends and we're having dinner with some more new friends. And I'm like, wow, you guys are more social now than you've ever been. And God is using that evangelistically. Isn't that beautiful? Here's a life transition in my life. Happened a year and a half ago. Never wanted it, but I was forced into it. We got a dog. That is a terrifying life transition. Never had a dog, and I'm not a dog person, but my family won, and we got one. And I was moaning, I don't want a dog, you know. And then I said, you know what? What are the opportunities this transition brings? And I've seen a couple. For one, I'm taking walks out on a path with this dog, and those walks have been very good at helping me connect with the Lord. I, here's another one. Uh, relationships of neighbors. As I walk the dog, it turns out these dogs, you know, it's like a special club. Everybody's got a dog. Hey, who are you? Let me meet your dog. And relationships with neighbors that could lead to opportunities to help people far from God find new life in Christ. Turns out this transition's got its benefits. They all do. Friends, the transition may be to a difficult chapter in life, but ask God, say, Lord, help me discover the unique opportunities to be of service to you that this new set of circumstances brings my way. All right, let's, let's go to the last. The last of the four is engage. In verse four, it says this, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Friends, isn't that beautiful? They probably arrived at these towns, heart pounding. They were a fugitive. But they went from fugitive to evangelist very quickly. What, what does that mean? That means that when they ran, they got to their new world, their new normal, and they said, it's time for us to dive back in, to live life in service to the Lord and tell these new people about Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? I heard it said that sometimes when we, we're grieving a loss, it's time to stop existing and start living. And that's really true, friends. When you get into your new normal, by the grace of God, say, Lord, I'm not just going to sit on the couch. I'm not just going to moan and complain that the one chapter ended. I'm going to fully engage with you in this new chapter of my life, living in full submission to your leadership to see how I can be of service to you. So let's, let's look at those four again, can we? Grieve, trust, trust that God is present and active. Discover, discover the opportunities that the new chapter of life affords you to be of service to God in a unique way. And then engage, dive in with his help, live for him with gusto. Friends, it's uh, interesting how that can be applied to a small group. There's a, two couples in our church that were in a group together and they were love and small group. But God showed up and led by his spirit for them to do something rather abrupt, to split the group into two groups, one couple leading one, the other couple leading the other. It was something that was hard. It was difficult, but God used it. Take a listen to their story. I'm Patty Lee. I'm Louis Lee. Uh, we've been going to Compass Church now for just almost a year. He's like, hey, we were invited to join this small group for me. I'm like, okay, you know, it, it'll be fun. Right away, I was like, boy, I, I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't have enough time. Uh, I barely have enough time just for the, the activities that we do with our kids. And so um, we actually kind of um, stood them up, I think, that first week. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we were able to, to go back in that second week. And, you know, I really just uh, felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit saying, you know, you, you need to give this a try. Mm -hmm. So uh, we talked it over and, and we went and uh, we were just, it was, it was amazing. Was I excited? Absolutely. But I didn't really foresee the impact that it would have on our lives. I'm Courtney Whitted. I'm Jordan Whitted. So we've been 
coming to the Compass now for about six years. What prompted the, the discussion really to consider splitting the group was primarily the opening of the new campus, right? We yeah. knew that we would have uh, hundreds of new families coming in the doors and we wanted to make sure that people that wanted to get connected in had a place to be connected. And we wanted to make sure that we were part of that and that we were open and available because um, our group was full, you know? Um, so we wanted to make sure that there were more opportunities for these new families to connect and feel welcome and part of our family. At that time, we, we through some uh, prayer um, and, and also discussion with my wife, uh, you know, we were talking with our, our group leader, John, and um, we, we um, decided to, um, the group to split, and split in a sense of provide more opportunity uh, for others um, to really, I think, just not only be welcomed into what small groups are all about, but, you know, an opportunity that may not have existed for some of our families um, if this split didn't occur. So I think that with our last group, we were at that point and, and everything was very healthy and, and we enjoyed being around one another and um, just a lot of great times together. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's this drive to really fulfill the Great Commission where like, we don't want to just keep this to ourselves. We want to share this experience with other people and um, you know, how do we take this same feeling, the same model and, and push it out to, to other people and, and let other people experience it. So. As we split, um, we made some, it was difficult because you're with people who you've been vulnerable with, you shared life with uh, every week, and you shared some, um, they've been in those encouragers for you. So um, there was some sadness, uh, but that was quickly uh, followed by just some um, expectance of what's to come. And uh, you know, boy, what, what was to come was something that we never imagined. And we split um, with a couple group members staying with us and a couple group members going with Patty and Lewis to lead. And, you know, very quickly and easily, both of our, you know, new groups formed and, and filled up. And it's been a really great experience since then. You know, being able to experience and, and witness some of the new families coming in and, and seeing kind of where they're coming from, from life, different life stages, um, you know, as you get to know them, as you dive into people's lives, like things have come out that, you know, you can tell that they're thinking about, they're, they're thinking about how to walk in the light, how to, um, you know, what it means to, to follow Christ and um, just coming from different periods of their, of their, their growth and their faith. And so um, being able to witness that, walk alongside them, encourage them, and even vice versa, having them able to, to be able to encourage us um, has been uh, just a really awesome thing to continue to witness. So what do you think? Life transitions, they are difficult. But friends, if we'll embrace them biblically, God redeems them and does good stuff in us, does good stuff through us. In fact, I think it can be said that from the days of Acts till now, for the last 2,000 years, the Lord has been redeeming life transitions to advance his cause all over this world. People have moved to new towns, new neighborhoods, they've had new co-workers, uh, they've had new friends. And though it's always been difficult, God says, oh, I'm going to use this. And sure enough, today, all the way over in Chicagoland, we are beneficiaries of courageous Christians who have made transitions well. And churches have been born, new campuses have been born, new groups have been born. May we be godly men and women humbly submitting to his leadership in all life transitions. And may he do much in us and through us along the way. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the journey of life, for the story you're writing for each of us. We'll acknowledge that chapter changes are really hard, really exciting, but also sad. Would you make us good at them? Help us follow the model you lay out here. And may our church be bubbling with God-ordained transitions that lead to expansion, more groups, more people finding new life in Jesus. Please, Lord, use us, grow us, make our lives beautiful in your eyes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.